So, committee, we are um, back at the leg question, and um, as we talked about yesterday, the idea is to make this our immediate priority. Um, just to skip briefly to another bill that has moved so far down the priority list, it will vanish, um, which is the child care um, piece, the, the homeschooling piece. Um, Jim and I have tried to capture what I what I was thinking about, and it's amazingly difficult to isolate because it turns out people don't. It's not that someone says I'm a parent and this person is, is going to be the homeschooler for my kid. The person says I'm a parent, and then they make a list of people who will have ongoing instruction as their kids. So the only way to do it would be to have all of those people background checked. Yeah. Um, and for you know, some of the testimony we heard from Retta was that people will use five or six or seven different people to provide math instruction or history instruction. So Jim and I, in drafting, went at it four or five different ways. I just don't see a way to do it at this point that's as surgical as I was hoping. So the only other way to do it is to rewrite that section of the title to make it clear that we would probably be expanding the background check in any event much beyond what I thought. Um, so it wouldn't be a single background check for a set of parents. It might be five. And I don't, I don't think that that's necessary. That's not a road I want to go down. So as the sponsor of the bill, I'm making a decision myself to pull the language to one side. If anybody's um, enamored of the idea now and wants to talk further, I, we can do that. But for now, I'm just kind of taking that off our list. I will communicate that to Retta. She can communicate it to her people. Um, so that is to say that our, our priorities are now lead number one, um, number two, the, the pre-K bill, and then the ethnic studies bill, which is um, is on our wall, but which the House is going to be sending us, I think, next week. Do we plan on taking up uh, either one of Senator Brock's bills that came out today with Act 46? Haven't, haven't looked at those yet. But to go back to Act 46, my intention is not to, um, in general, do anything that. Right. Um, one just to delay out a year. Yep. Of course, right there. We will be having that discussion. Okay. For sure. So, um, Let's pick up with uh, Commissioner Levine. Commissioner Levine? Just outside, let's get oh. some water. And then we'll okay. Um, yeah, let's um, just vamp for a second then. Do you know what he looks like? Could you? He's very tall. Can you tall. pick him out of the crowd? He's tall. He's tall. He's I just saw him in the water. Jim's not here. Oh, um, Michael Craig. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is since yesterday. Yeah, this is just an okay. hour ago. If, if you could um, make copies for everyone. Yeah, please. Absolutely. So Michael apparently has made some changes since our discussion yesterday. Um, to Michael in the room? No, do you uh, want him? He didn't know if he wanted him. You're good. Um, he's he's only available until two. Uh, well, I think these are easy enough to understand, these changes. Um, only but I would like the commissioner. I'll go with him. Do you have more copies of these? So I can... For the room, you mean? For the room, yeah. Uh, do you have more copies of this, Jim? I can get. Oh. If you wouldn't mind running. Um, Ten. Yeah. So we can uh, accommodate copies for people in a few minutes. So just the highlights. Molly has sent the Um Why don't we go ahead and swap swap okay. in, in if you wouldn't mind? Um, I, 
I don't want to wait uh, much, much longer. So. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so we have heard um, great things about your work in this field from my colleagues from Madison. Um, so okay. if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to the record and, and just. Sure. Um, I can pass this around. There should be enough for. Let's see. Maybe one more. And there's some extras for the room. <clears throat> um, so thanks for inviting me, um, Senator Hardy, and uh, thanks for taking up lead testing the schools. It's incredibly important. Um, I'm Molly Costanza Robinson, a professor at Middlebury College. Uh, my background is in analytical chemistry, um, basically the science of identifying and quantifying small amounts of stuff like lead in drinking water, um, and environmental chemistry. So I study pollution and health effects of pollution. Um, I've included a bunch here that I think for the interest of time, I'll probably skip ahead. I'm sure the health commissioner will talk a little bit about the health effects. Um, but uh, Ruth has asked me to focus a little bit on sampling methodology. Um, some of the, I guess the, the take home message would, would be that it's not difficult to sample for lead, but it's easy to do wrong. Um, and so there's some important details that um, I think would need to be in the bill and um, in order to do it right. Um, so I thought I'd provide a little bit of um, background before getting into what I read in the proposed legislation. Um, that is important for what I'd want to say about the legislation. Um, so if I'm starting on where, do, where does lead in school water come from, um, some important points there, and I'm, I'm sure some of this you already know. Um, lead can come into the school in the water supply itself. Um, that's sort of the less likely source of lead in schools, um, but it is possible. Um, the more likely source of lead would be in some of these pretty pictures that we've shown here from the solder that's used to connect pipes, um, from the pipes themselves, from the fixtures themselves. And um, as you'll see from a sampling methodology standpoint, um, I sort of separate those um, in school sources into two categories, one being the external source, which is the actual fixture that you actively are using and interacting with that the water comes directly out of. And then the other category of source would be sort of in the wall, all the pipes, the solder, the, the valves, the connections that, if those were the problem, would require a lot bigger remediation um, than just the external piece. Just one second. Chris, if we, uh, we swap someone into your spot, that's all that. Sounds like you're doing a good <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the important pieces that goes along with lead coming from that source is to recognize that when we talk about lead free, it's not actually required to be free of lead. Um, and so uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act in 1986 allowed up to 8% lead to be in the pipes and the fittings and up to 0.2% lead in the solder that holds the fittings together. That was reduced um, in the amendment in 2011. Um, and state of Vermont actually was ahead of the curve and made some of those reductions in the allowable amount of lead earlier in 2010. Um, but it is still the case that today, when you go and buy stuff on the shelf that says lead free, it is not free of lead. Um, and that is one of the places that this lead is creeping into to water. And what goes along with that is, is the fact that um, you, you can have a faucet right here that is delivering good clean water and one right next door can be delivering high lead depending on when that faucet was installed, when um, the solder that was used, that sort of thing, depending on the time frame. So lead is a, it's a very localized issue um, and that'll figure into some of my, you know, what I like about the S40 as written um, and potential changes um, is that it's, it's, it's spotty. You can have high lead and low lead in the same building. Um, getting to the importance of, of how you sample, there's really three things that I would look for in a, a sampling methodology, um, and I'll kind of cover them each in turn. The first is that the sampling produce a sample that's representative of what children would actually be exposed to. Um, the second is that it be sensitive, so that if there is a small amount of lead that you're actually able to detect it, 
And the third is that it actually provide actionable information so that if there is lead, you know what to do about it. Um, so I'll cover each of those in turn. And I thought I'd start with um, maybe a lesson learned from New York City schools. Um, I've just shown some headlines on this page. Uh, New York City schools tested all their public schools. They spent many millions of dollars to sample. Um, and they reported this to the media, what they thought were very favorable results. Um, they only found a third of the schools had at least one outlet that exceeded their action level. Um, and only 1% of all the outlets they tested exceeded their action level. So they thought that was pretty good news. Um, they still had work to do, but it was good news. When the New York Times looked into their sampling methodology, they found that they were using methodologies that were not consistent with the recommendations put forward by the EPA. Um, in particular, they had flushed all of the sampling lines for two hours the night before sampling, which I sort of think of as equivalent to, you know, cleaning your house before the in-laws come over, and then pretending it's like that all the time. Um, it's not, my house is not like that all the time. Um, and so they weren't getting a representative picture of what children would be exposed to on a daily basis. Lots of public criticism. Um, one quote in particular from one of the research groups in the nation that's kind of most associated with, with lead and, and um, limiting its um, children's exposure to lead, uh, was quoted as saying New York City schools may have just broken the national record for flawed testing. Um, another researcher said the results should be thrown in the garbage and the city needs to start over. Okay, So it's not hard to test right, but it's easy to do wrong. And if you're not doing it right, there's really no point in doing it. Um, so when they retested, <clears throat> it wasn't a third of the schools. It was 83% of the schools. It wasn't 1% of the outlets. It was 8% of the outlets. Um, in one, one, uh, one school in Queens, the maximum lead level in water fountains under the flawed testing was 35 parts per billion, which is still mm -hmm. high. <laughs> um, but when they did the testing properly, it was 3,500. Um, so it dramatically underestimated. And I think that's the piece is when you don't do the sampling right, it's very hard to bias the results high. It's very easy to bias the results low. And it's exactly what you don't want if you're looking to protect children's health. Um, so in terms of representative, um, trying to represent accurately student and staff exposure, the big variable that, to think about is stagnation time. So that's the time the water spends in the pipe equilibrating with those fixtures that do, despite being lead free, still have some lead in them potentially. Um, and so some of the recommendations that the EPA makes, I'll refer a lot to the three T's document, which you may be familiar with. Um, and I have a reference at the end um, for you to look up. Avoiding anything that is atypical in terms of system manipulation. So that's things like avoiding flushing, avoiding um, replacing, there's the screens, the aeration screens that are right on the end of the faucet. You don't want to clean those right before testing. Again, that goes into the like pretending your house is clean for your mother-in-law. Um, the other piece, and this may influence the time frame um, and sort of staffing um, related to carrying out S40, uh, if it passes, um, is that sampling should take place when the school is in typical use, which means during the school year. It's not something you can say, hey, we'll just we'll take care of it this summer, um, because then the water system won't be in its normal flushing mode. Um, so. <clears throat> in the work that I've done, I forgot to mention in the beginning, I've been, last year and a half, I've been working with the Addison County School District testing all of their schools. Um, and so our typical is to go in on a Saturday morning. So Friday school had the typical flow regime, you have the overnight stagnation time, and then you sample on like a Saturday morning before any teachers are working. And yes, there's teachers we've had to be like, yeah, I know it's 6 a.m. on a Saturday, you need to leave, I need to sample. Um, so that, that's just something to, to consider in terms of um, when the sampling happens. In terms of uh, sensitivity um, to the presence of lead, important variables are the sample size and the, the sampling sequence. Um, I was pleased that in the, the bill as written that it recommends a 250 milliliter sample size. Um, other, for other purposes, testing for lead, they use a one liter sample size. Um, and if you look at sort of the, the diagram I have here, you can think about 
typically it is the faucet, the exterior portion. Um, just in, in my sampling experience, um, that's also true for the state 16 school pilot that they did. Um, in almost every case, it's that exterior fixture piece that has been the primary source. So you can imagine that the water that comes out of that first is the highest in lead. That's your pulse of lead. And then any additional sampling volume that you're pulling from deeper in the system, you're effectively diluting the sample. So you're reducing the concentration. Um, you're losing sensitivity. And there's also a, a representative piece there. Most kids don't go to the water fountain and drink a liter of water. Right, so um, that smaller sample size is what the EPA recommends for sampling in schools. <clears throat> the other piece is that you should sample from upstream to downstream. Um, I didn't see reference to that in the, in the bill, um, nor did I see reference to that in the state's pilot. Um, they had the schools do the sampling. Um, so that's something that I think should be considered. Um, EPA really wants to you, you sample from upstream to downstream. And you can imagine if you are pulling water from fixture number four, for example, that's going to pull water along the entire pathway um, and start flushing all of those earlier sampling points. Okay? Whereas if you sample first from the upstream number one, you're, only, you're not compromising any other sample. Um, so that's uh, an important piece that you're not, your sampling itself isn't flushing the system in a way that is inappropriate. Um, in terms of actionable information, um, the biggest thing here that I would be interested in is you need to find out the source of the lead. Um, is it that exterior portion or do you have to open up the walls? That's a huge financial um, consideration. Um, and in the draft of the bill that I saw, I didn't, I only saw reference to a first draw sample, which is a good starting point. So the first draw sample, as shown here, that's the first 250 mils to leave the faucet after that overnight stagnation time. Um, that emphasizes sort of the fixtures contribution to lead. It also, that water came through the pipes, so it kind of uh, gives you a sense of kind of everything, but emphasizes the fixture. Um, what I'd like to see is a second type of sample added. This was used in the state pilot. This is recommended by the EPA. It, it's what I've used in my work. Um, and that's a flush sample. So you go through the whole school, you take your first draw samples, then you go through the school again, you flush each outlet for 30 seconds. That eliminates all that early water and now you're pulling water from deeper in the system so that you can understand is that the source of the lead or not. Um, in almost every case I've seen in, in Addison County Central District that it's that exterior portion. So that's, that's great news in terms of a cheaper fix than having to go into the walls. So, excuse me, you would only do that if you found lead the fr from the first draw? Um, I, I've done I've done both, uh, where I've, at, at the high school, I just did all first draw samples and said, let's see what we see. Mm -hmm. And then I went back and did flush samples where there were elevated levels. Um, from a staffing standpoint, it's probably faster and easier to sit, take that second flush sample while you're already there. Um, whether you analyze it or not can be a, a different story. You, you can only analyze those. But it's actually collecting the sample takes and getting to the school and getting there early before teacher. It's, it can be disruptive. So I think there's different ways you could go about that. Um, and do feel free to stop me and ask questions. I appreciate that. Um, that's just a little background. In terms of com specific comments, um, I've included more here. I think in the interest of time, I'll just highlight a few things from each of these slides. Um, one, it, in terms of support for what I saw, I, I think it's a really awesome start. Um, and I really appreciated, this is bullet point two, that the bill as written, or that I saw as introduced, suggested testing all outlets that are potentially used for consumption. And that word potentially I have underlined because when I first went into the schools, I did get a little pushback saying, oh, well, our students don't use those. No, our students know to only drink from the bottle fillers. Oh, we, we tell our teachers this. Um, I heard that again and again, and I said, well, can I just sample anyway? And then I asked the real experts, my school kids, <laughs> and I said, where do you drink when you're in this classroom? Usually they do use bottle fillers. 
Um, but they said, no, we sometimes use those classroom sinks. I also had teachers contact me. All my information's available on the web. Um, I emailed all my teacher friends and said, hey, take a look. And they said, that's my classroom. And I do have kids drink from there sometimes because the bottle filler's down the hall. Um, so I really think that word potentially is important. Um, if you're wanting to protect the kids, you can't make assumptions about them following the rules all the time, or to even teachers following the rules all the time. So one of the things, if I may, um, yeah. we talked about in here was whether or not to test the sinks and the bathrooms. Um, and so it sounds like you would recommend that we do that because especially in locker rooms where kids may be coming in from practice and using those sinks. Right. So that's, I mean, I, I think there's certainly room to do a larger survey and understand what kids are doing, but I do think it should be based on what is actually happening, not what we presume to be happening. Right, so the assumption is that they're going to probably use those They're probably going to use those yeah. things. Um, and, and just, you know, one example, there's a, a school in Addison County where there's a, a hand washing sink that tested it had 26 parts per billion. Hand washing sinks, according to the Department of Health, should not be used for food preparation. But it's a beautiful big faucet where you can get your water bottle under there. It's accessible to students in the cafeteria. I'm like, change it, change it, please. Um, it's undoubtedly used at some point, even though the rules say hand washing sinks are for hand washing only. Um, a, a similar type of thing is with custodial sinks. If, if the custodial sinks are in a closet, I'm not worried about them. If they, as they are at Mary Hogan Elementary, if there is a custodial sink that is in the kitchen that is beautifully accessible for putting your big igloo bottle that you're gonna take out to the sports fields, I think that's important for that to be safe. It's just too convenient to be used. Um, so I really appreciated that word potentially. It's, it's a small word, but I think it makes a big difference. Um, and I think the other, I've kind of covered, um, I'll skip other points on that slide. Um, in terms of specific recommendations, some of which I've already mentioned, adding a flush sample I think would be important. Um, the second bullet point, page three, line five, um, this is regarding the, the stagnation time. Standing, uh, it talks about the water standing in the pipes for at least six hours. The EPA recommends eight for schools because that's more representative of how people aren't in the schools until midnight. They may get there at six, but they're not there till midnight. And so it's just an atypical, and again, it would bias the results low compared to what kids would actually be. Um, so I would recommend adopting the EPA guidance on that. Um, small thing, page three, line nine. Um, it talks about sampling outlets where the water would be used for drinking or cooking purposes. And I would just expand that a little bit and say consumption because there's plenty of schools that have ice makers and ice machines that draw on the same water supply and again are used heavily, especially by the athletics, athletics teams. Um, probably the most important thing that I would kind of just want to raise is um, considerations regarding the one PPB action level. So I was um, really happy to see a health-based standard. Um, I've put on this uh, graphic here just a sense of, um, as you've probably heard, there is no safe level of lead that is, uh, has been established. So the EPA goal is zero. You can't regulate zero. You can't prove zero in a laboratory. So that can't be the standard. Um, but the other, the EPA action level at 15 parts per billion, the FDA limit for bottled water of five parts per billion, those are not health-based standards. Um, one is a regulatory, it's not our problem until <laughs> level, that's the EPA. The FDA, the five PPB, um, is really a level that was deemed to be practicable. It was like, we know we can achieve it. We know bottled water can get there. It, it wasn't a health-based level. The one part per billion level, um, the first safety level was put out by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I think that's the most health protective goal. Um, that's the right level if you're worried about health. My only concern about that level, um, th there's some limited science basically in terms of whether that level can be reliably achieved given the fixtures that are on the market. So as I've said several times, lead-free does not mean free of lead. So the 
the, the standards that are used, the, the amount of lead that's allowed in fixtures, pipes, solder, et cetera, that can be used, I haven't seen a clear demonstration. I mean, they were not designed to achieve a one part per billion level. So I don't know that if a school says, oh, I had three parts per billion, I'm going to go buy a new faucet, it's a lead-free faucet, I can't say that it is guaranteed to work. It may still be too high. Um, the evidence that I do have, where, where we do have science, uh, I've tested 900 something um, samples. 45% of the samples in Addison County come back that they would meet the one PPB level. 45% of the samples of the outlets would meet this one part per billion action level. So clearly it is possible. I don't know that every faucet out there would be able to achieve that. Um, there's one study, a 2018 study by, again, uh, a group that's very well known, Mark Edwards. He's one of, he's a engineer that kind of busted open the Flint case on the national stage. Um, this is what he, all he does in his life is, is lead testing. He put out a very small study of a small number of faucets and showed that some of them allow um, the water to meet that one part per billion standard. And another faucet, the water came out at three parts per billion. And these are all faucets that meet all the federal testing standards for lead free. Um, the state pilot of 16 schools, they have a lot of data to draw on. I'm in contact with folks at the Department of Health. Um, they, the, the samples that came back elevated in their pilot, they used a 15 part per billion elevated level. They either took those outlets offline or they replaced them. And I said, I, I don't see your retesting data on, on the web yet. And I just talked with my contact there today and they said, yeah, we have the data. Um, it's not available, like I can't send it to you right now. But that would be more information than I have access to right now in terms of when they replaced it, were they able to achieve one part per billion? Mm -hmm. I'm, I know they can beat the 15. I mean, the 15 is ridiculously high. Um, can, are they getting to one routinely with all of their fixture replacements? I think that's, they would have a lot of data that would support or not that let's, let's answer say that question. Weren't. Hypothetically, where would you suggest we put the standard? I, I think I would want to, um, I want data, I want evidence, right? So I, I think if there's certain types of faucets that are routinely meeting that standard, I think there could be a role for having an approved list of, sure, all of these technically meet the standards, this is what we approve for use in Vermont schools, for example. We know it is possible to achieve these because 45% of the outlets are meeting that standard. So we know it's possible. I just don't know if well, every the, faucet out there can achieve that. The countervailing argument would be if 55% were not meeting it with new faucets, then have we set too sensitive a, a standard um, in our testing? So I hear you saying we need more data, mm -hmm. especially retesting data, and we have the commissioner yep. here, so hopefully that's a doable um, piece. So we'll, your other recommendations are, are admirably clear. Mm -hmm. So um, I see you leaving us with a, a, a question to ask other witnesses. Exactly. Yeah, okay. That's exactly. Um, I, I, from a health protection standpoint, getting rid of those higher exposures first, I mean, that will always be a priority. Um, so whether it's something that you start with a three or a five and lower it over, you know, I, you know, I think, y yeah, you want to reduce those higher exposures first. If, if you have limited funds, limited staff, you know, whatever it is, of course, those higher concentrations. Um, but I would say to, the, to your question about is the testing too sensitive, I would say, well, the health-based standard, the health advisory level that the state of Vermont has set is one part per billion. So that has to be our goal. Yeah. Um, and then it's a question of how can we technically move there? Is it an approved list of faucets? Is it further testing to demonstrate what we need to do to achieve it? Uh, 
As you probably didn't see, this is new language where it says that the sampling shall be conducted according to the EPAs. Yeah. Does, does, if we did that, does that meet your like second testing and upstream and those things? It, or it we does. Also it does. Almost everything uh, that I've referred to here is in that three T's document. The only, um, from a sampling perspective, 100%, the three T's document uses the 15 part per billion action level. Again, it's not a safety-based standard, so that's that's one place where I would hope this legislation right. would differ. But from sampling, sampling. methodology, that's, that's the gold standard that we have right now. Okay, and the second question, are, so we know that lead-free doesn't mean it's free of lead. Is there a way to find out if a faucet is actually free of lead? Are there lead-free, lead-free? There faucets? are truly lead-free faucets. Um, it's not clear that there's consistent labeling for such faucets. So, so there can there's stainless steel faucets that can be lead free. There's plastic faucets that can be lead free. Um, maybe the health commissioner can speak to. I mean, there might be some trade offs. Plastics have some of their own inherent um, issues as regards health. Um, but from strictly a lead standpoint, yes, there are faucets that are available. Um, I've actually asked facilities folks, I said, can you do you have access to these? Or how much more expensive are they? I don't have answers to those sorts of questions. I don't know. And then you have additional considerations. Some additional considerations. These um, were just things that I, f I flagged, um, either because I didn't fully understand them, but I at least had some hint of a worry about their implications. Um, one was the building definition exclusion, page, page two. Um, Line 17 to 19. It says building means any structure, facility, addition, or wing that may be occupied, used by children or students. Building shall not include any structure, facility, etc., that is lead free as defined by the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, I couldn't find reference in the Safe Drinking Water Act to what a, a lead free building is certainly lead-free components to buildings, which would then go back to my comment about lead-free does not mean free of lead. So I worried that this could could mean, and I wasn't sure what the intent was, but it could mean that if a school was built recently and has all of these newest lead-free, mm -hmm. it's not guaranteeing that it's safe. Um, so I just wasn't 100% sure what that exclusion was meant to do and what it would do in practical terms. So I just kind of wanted to flag that for. Mm -hmm. um, the second piece, child care facilities already covered by state law. This is on page three, lines 20. Uh, child care facilities in the state shall test drinking water for lead contamination as required under this chapter unless otherwise required to test for lead in drinking water under the state law. Um, my understanding of the current requirements for licensed child care facilities, um, they're less stringent. They, they allow up to 15 parts per billion lead. And so my concern would be it's these youngest children that are most vulnerable due to their developmental stage, um, especially, I mean, those young kids, you, I would not want state licensed child care to allow a higher amount of lead than other schools. Um, and so I would, um, again, I don't, I don't know about the legislative process, whether that requirement for state licensure is changed or whether you simply make licensed child care um, facilities subject to these provisions. But I would say the most health protective of the provisions mm -hmm. are those that should be used for those yeah, child the first, care. The first part of the sentence does that. The second part is what allows the... Yeah, unless the otherwise required. Um, so we could, theoretically, we could put a period there unless it involves some, we, we have I, a lot of trouble in here with dual authorities over various agencies, right. but in, in this sense, we're already, um, in the first part of the sentence, we are roping in some child care facilities, so if we can rope in some, we can rope in all. Right. I mean, even if that comma <laughs> were changed to a period and it yeah. was just full stop, Um, and again, I, yeah, I don't understand whether you have to change that other law. That's why I just, I'm flagging these for consideration. Um, and then the final piece um, was sort of acknowledging my previous 
comments about the one part per billion action level. If it if if we do find out that that's not reliably achievable in all cases, and it becomes a two or it becomes a three, whatever it becomes, um, I just I like the idea of requiring this the state to revisit that science and revisit the technology. Um, the Government Accountability Office research arm for Congress um, recently sent a report to Congress this summer saying the federal guidelines basically are woefully lacking in terms of lead. And so there's some hope that we would get better um, lead laws and regulations from the federal level that might give us better faucets, or whether that's something that can happen separately at the state level. Again, I'm not a policy person. Um, but I like the idea that you would be asked to revisit the science and ratchet down until you can get to that safety-based level rather than this, what's feasible currently. We know it's feasible. We know some, many of these faucets are coming back and achieving this level, so it's possible. And I think everything we can do to drive it in that direction is what I would recommend. That was amazingly helpful. Thank you. Uh, any well, thank final you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you for inviting me. We, we may well thank be you. back in touch with you at some point, Fantastic. especially when we have a semi-final draw. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just to take your time. That sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Commissioner, if you could uh, join us uh, Sure. Do you have a clean one? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So I assume you heard the question about the retesting data. Um, yeah, and if we have that data, I'm going to have to forward that to you. At that would be great. Thank you. Future time. And we can forward that on to you and yeah. tell us what's going on. Howdy. Hey. Hmm. Good. Hi. Good. I'll make some opening comments. Commissioner Mark Levine, Commissioner of Health. Um, I did not hear everything in the prior presentation, so if there is redundancy, consider it uh, planned redundancy. <laughs> it's helpful. Um, I don't know how much lead was introduced from the science-based aspect of what it does to the human body, um, but lead is obviously, we wouldn't be here talking about it otherwise, it's a highly toxic metal. It can cause serious and permanent health effects Predominantly, they involve the brain, the nervous system, the kidneys, um, and we're most concerned about the impact of lead on children's growth and development, including their brain development, including their ability to learn, and their ability to avoid having behavior problems. Um, we know that the effects of lead poisoning are preventable, but they are also irreversible. The um, science behind lead, when we say there's no safe level of lead in the body, this is one of those things in uh, medicine and in public health that is pretty black and white. There are so many things that are gray, but this is black and white, and the science is quite clear. And I think that you heard also that as we get older, we're still vulnerable to the effects of lead but the most profound vulnerability is in children and in pregnant women. The uh, most common mechanism for lead to get into the human body, and especially children's bodies, is actually not through water. It's through paint, and it's through pre-1978 housing, of which Vermont has like 70% of its housing stock in that uh, range. Um, so, that's obviously the highest priority when it comes to avoiding lead poisoning in children. When asked about how much contribution water provides, uh, the EPA estimates 20% or more of the total, we'll call it burden of lead in the body may come through that route. So not as significant as through paint, but not insignificant either. <clears throat> and 
Lead is colorless, it's odorless, it's tasteless. Uh, it would not be evident to anyone drinking water that had lead in it that they were doing so unless the water was tested. So if you don't test, you don't know. It's pretty much what goes on there. Um, you've heard the fact that we did a pilot study. And there's a report on our website, if any of you have um, not had the chance to read it. Um, that basically is the Vermont Lead in School Drinking Water Testing Pilot Report from last fall. And I invite you, it's fairly concise reading, uh, to peruse it. But we tested uh, 16 schools, and we tried to be um, somewhat scientific in our approach to the testing in terms of figuring out uh, who should be in the pilot. Uh, so some uh, criteria that we used were socioeconomic factors, geography, size of the student body, uh, if there was a pre-K program in the school, if the school was on a public water supply system, if there was corrosion control used at the drinking water treatment facility, uh, and what we knew about lead levels in kids' blood already in those communities. And out of these 16 schools, um, five of the schools did show uh, at least one tap that had a level above the EPA level of 15 parts per billion, which you've heard is not a health-based level. Um, the health advisory level is one, and every school had at least three taps that exceeded one. So again, if you don't test, you don't know. Um, how many, uh, out of curiosity, how many exceeded, let's say, three or five? Uh, I can possibly answer that with a quick look at a table. Yeah, we don't actually have it listed that way. I'm sure we could reanalyze the data. It's only six schools. That was schools. the question we were just... Right, if you wanted to find them in between level, what they looked like. Um, that still doesn't tell you what they were like after remediation, though. Yes. <clears throat> so, obviously, this data was compelling enough to us, and it now is to both the executive branch and the legislative branch, to warrant uh, creating a program whereby all schools have the benefit of this testing and all children have the benefit of drinking water free of lead. So I think I will stop my comments there and let you ask me questions. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to start with, um, I know that the, we talked about radon for a couple of years. And I know yes. that Department of Health has money from the federal government to test a certain number of schools per year. Mm -hmm. They were confident, as I remember, that they could have up, up the number, but it was a voluntary program, and districts were not asking to be tested because they didn't want to be found to have radon. So right. very low take-up rate for volu voluntary. So this pilot was not voluntary. You you selected the schools, um, is that correct? But we did not force them to to undergo the testing program. So uh, they. They accepted the testing. Program. So, you, but you suggested yes. to them that. exactly. Okay. Um, so then, my question would be, what uh, the Senate President Pro Tem has laid out um, is immediate testing that is within the current year um, mm -hmm. that we will do all schools in Vermont. Yep. And I'm wondering, um, did the he had an estimate, I believe, from your um, department. $860,000? For the testing component. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah ours is a little higher in the $900,000 range. Okay. Um, and do you have the personnel, or would you hire out for that? Both. <clears throat> so the Department of Health is a obviously certified testing lab mm -hmm. and does this work well. Um, depending upon the pace of testing, and the timeline, um, the department is still prepared to engage other certified labs 
uh, that are acceptable to us to engage in that effort. Okay. So does, any, does that timeline strike you as doable? Um, in other words, there yeah. wouldn't be any bottleneck in terms of personnel, assuming that the money flows. Yeah, assuming that the money flows, it's, it's certainly doable. Yeah. Uh, the, the luxury of time would help with things like making sure our data management system was up to speed to accommodate all of this, and we could do all the appropriate reporting to schools, to parents, et cetera, uh, and create that feedback loop that's so necessary to make sure that things aren't just found, but they're actually dealt with. Um, but again, um, a, a pace of testing that had a one-year time limit would be doable. I have to remind everyone that one doesn't do this testing during the three summer months yeah. uh, because the school's not in use. And I think you've heard a little bit about the fact that you know water is just sitting in taps and it's not flowing all the time. Um, so we want to do it at a time that the schools are in use. Um, okay, and we saw that first uh, data laid out on the spreadsheet for us. So I'm, I'm imagining that your ultimate goal would be to produce uniform data for all of these schools. Exactly. Okay, and then my could, could I make one other comment Please. just because I don't get to talk in front of this committee very often and uh, one thing in the health uh, world that is very much 2019, though it should have been forever, is the concept of health equity. So health equity implies that there are no systemic issues, whether they be institutional or systems issues, whether they be racism, whether they be anything that causes a disparity in data from one group to another, either for racial or socioeconomic or gender-based reasons. Uh, everyone has the same opportunity to be healthy. One lesson to be learned from the radon program is one can have a state-of-the-art program that's designed to impact the future health of everyone in a particular building and have a very low uptake of that build, of that program, perhaps by communities that have a uh, higher educational level or communities that have uh, more resources to spend, etc. cetera. And uh, you create disparities and inequity across the state because some kids are going to benefit from that, as well as the teachers who are perhaps in those schools longer than many of the kids, um, and some communities aren't going to benefit. Um, so that's why we envision this program, you know, including all of the schools in Vermont, and everyone has an equal opportunity to have lead-free drinking water uh, within a time frame that uh, is reasonable so that uh, no kid is going to miss out on this benefit. And then one last question. The $900,000 uh, for testing, does that include retesting? It does. It does. So I can tell you that the estimate was based on a cost of about $20 per tap, mm -hmm. an average. And this is, again, schools are all different sizes, of 50 taps per school um, and two samples per tap. Um, so about 45,000 tests times $20. Um, it's not exactly back of the envelope, but it's also you know, an estimate based on, yep. again, what we know about sizes of schools. Um, and, and, and you're right, there has to be uh, a requirement for obviously post-remediation testing uh, in place. And that's included in the estimate. You know, I'm, I'm believing it is. Um, we should be sure. But I'm not 100% sure. If you could get back yeah. to that question. Uh, yeah, it doesn't? No. It does not. No. So, so are we talking yeah. about 1.8? Uh, yeah, well, no, but it depends again where the level is. Well, what I'm thinking you know, is. If we use our pilot so, as an example, you know, yeah. in terms of the number of faucets that would have to then be retested. So let's say. Yeah. You know, 30% you'd retest. Um, that would be a large number. Yeah. Well, let's just sign yeah, the envelope. Yeah, so let's, say, cool. let's say it was five for school, five okay. taps for school. So we're talking and about more than 900,000, and we're talking 
yeah. one point something. Right. So we will need, we have uh, JFO up next. Stephanie, there you go. Um, so Stephanie, I assume, has some metric that she's <laughs> developed and she laid out for us. I mean, didn't yeah. we just hear from the previous testimony that you had to retest more, um, more than half the ta taps? Because 45% of the taps were at one parts per million per billion. So 55% would have required retesting. And so we're talking about more but, than five But you taps don't know per. what level those other taps were, if they were greater than 15 or greater than 3 or greater than 5. I, I mean, I, I think 7% of ACSD taps failed the 15. Did you say 7? 7% 7 7. failed the 15. Yeah. 24% failed a 5. Uh -huh. PPB action level. And I, I got my 45 wrong. 65% failed the one. 65% of TAPS in ACSD. I have no guarantee that ACSD is representative of other schools. So yep. It's a snapshot. But, but, but useful. So $900,000 is an is a inaccurate number. We'll need something. Uh, it's, an, it's an initial testing. Yeah, that would include the testing. Mm -hmm. um, questions for the commissioner? So when you said two tests, that was the math I thought you said. Do you mean? Did you mean the preliminary test and then the flushed test? No, that's the way the testing is done. You do a preliminary. test. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You okay. said it right. Actually, a preliminary okay. test and a flushed test. Okay. So those are the two tests, yes. not a. So that's not pre a pre and post. So yeah, you at least get the two good tests. Yes. That's all I have on that question. The, I haven't. Yeah. Right. My other question, which I've been asked by constituents, is why we weren't testing that before or were we like wh oh yeah so um this has been a movement across states that's been probably since the mid early to mid 2010 era as opposed to you know forever and ever so we're aware of probably a dozen states now that have uh, got formalized programs in place all within the last several years so we just decided we needed to do this pilot because uh, there's evidence emerging around the country uh, that this is a problem, a potential problem. So we're, we're requiring the independent schools to test for lead. <clears throat> but the public schools, or the school that was on a, on a municipal water system was just assuming that so, it was right. safe because so, the municipal water is being tested yeah. for lead. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the same requirement that the home would have who is not on a municipal water. Is that true? Um, Would you like to clarify yeah, this? Yeah, please. If you could just start down. Uh, Brian Redmond, I'm the director for the Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection Division uh, within the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, so, so just to clarify, uh, we're really looking at, in, in terms of schools, um, child care facilities would be a different subset, but in terms of schools, um, two types, those that are served, uh, schools that are served by their own well, in and of themselves are public water systems. We refer to them as the non-transient, non-community water systems. There's about 150 of those uh, in the state of Vermont, 148 to 150, that number fluctuates. Those schools are obligated to test under the federal lead and copper rule, which has been discussed a little bit today. That is the standard of the 15 parts per billion. Your average Vermont school in a small uh, rural Vermont school would be required to test five samples um, under their obligations under the federal rule. Uh, it is not a program, and one of the key differences between what we're discussing today and what's required under the federal rule, it's not a TAP-specific program. That same rule regulates public water supplies throughout Vermont, your community water supplies, um, your Burlington's, your Berries, um, down to very, very small water systems. We have a lot of very small water systems in Vermont. Those are um, schools in those communities that are served by um, municipal water. Um, your your uh, statement was correct uh, that the testing is done to diagnose the larger geographical area, uh, and the schools themselves are not sampling sites. Uh, it's a risk-based approach to understand the proximity of the water and the potential for lead to leach out. So we look for the worst case scenarios, which is, happens to be single family residences of a certain era. 
So that is where the municipal water supplies are testing. So the schools, there's no obligation of a school that's receiving water from a public community water system to test all taps. Currently. Currently, yeah. And this is why this, the conversation that we had yesterday about the report that we got from Jim was just those those schools that were considered public water supplies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in my district, Middlebury wouldn't be part of it because that's a not a public water supply, but Ripton would be because they're on a well. And so, and it's not tap specific, so it's not getting at the lead in the taps. Um, can I ask another question yes. of the commissioner? So one of the things you mentioned um, that I actually had talked to Professor Costanza Robinson about this too is um, uh, notification to parents mm -hmm. and you know it's obviously something we want to notify parents after the fact of the results and what mm -hmm. schools are doing to remediate those results mm -hmm. um, my understanding at, at, at my conversations with Professor Costanza Robinson but also as a parent it's uh, also pretty important to let parents know ahead of time that you're testing saying exactly. we are doing this testing exactly. we are being proactive we are following the law we and so uh, do you see that as something we should include in the legislation yes. um, so that we make sure we have our, our pilot testing program operated exactly under that uh, thesis okay and we actually had model letters for the superintendents and school systems to utilize so that everybody was on the same playing field before we even did this okay so and that's we agree. Okay, excellent. And then another question is, um, we had a conversation yesterday in here about the um, the efficacy or preference for um, using the rulemaking process versus um, actually just laying it out in statute. Um, and um, we had, you know, a little bit of unsureness. Um, and part of it was because of the timeline is so tight with the uh, for good reasons mm -hmm. that we're trying to do this quickly to make sure our kids are safe. Um, but we also are requiring um, you to work with the secretary of as A and R mm -hmm. to um, create rules. Is that even possible in the timeline? And would what is your preference in terms of rules versus statute? Yeah. So from the outset, this has been a very important and strong collaboration between ANR and their subsection of DEC, mm -hmm. Health and the Agency of Education. Um, we're sensitive to the timeline issue and have been apprised by uh, the other agencies about the fact that things take time using the process. Is this a time we may introduce? Um, yeah. So, I mean, we, we actually, uh, in working uh, with the governor's office, also came up with a uh, proposal uh, that did not involve rulemaking and it did involve statutory change. Mm -hmm. um, Do you have it? Which we can. Maybe, maybe. Oh, is there, this is David, David England yes. or senior legislator. So I'm not David England, but we can get all counsel to help us out. So we can, we don't, we can get a full review of this action. Um, I, if I may, can I speak subsequently briefly? Briefly, but subsequently. Okay, briefly, briefly. In terms of meeting with, with great alacrity, we could adopt the Department of Health and Coordination with ANR could adopt protocols <laughs> as opposed to rulemaking. We need protocols to allow obviously maximum flexibility in terms of what is the most efficacious way to test the to provide the speed of what in place. The other option in terms of rulemaking, if you're worried about speed, is of course the, um, the general assembly could give uh, the authority to the departments to, to engage in emergency rulemaking. So emergency rules don't take the, the four or six months and it's like the date was top of the department of health and do it for a half. But emergency rulemaking goes into effect the moment that they're filed. It can go into effect the day that they're filed. So there is there's several groups that I'm not sure this would qualify as an emergency under. That's what the general sending could. Yeah, it yeah. does say you may use the word rulemaking mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to qualify. But you can, you can see why you need to use that sparingly because it takes out state papers, for example. Thank you very much.
Um, so, did I understand that you can share that language with us this afternoon? Yes. yes. Um, but not right now. Okay. 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 Um, that would be great. You know, we can we can have a couple of uh, different approaches. To mm -hmm. Other questions for the commissioner? Well, thank you, commissioner. I, I really appreciate. It. And, and if I could just uh, uh, personal note, it's it's wonderful to see your two agencies working together, but also the legislative branch and the executive branch yes. in service of, let's call it an emergency, um, something that I was mm -hmm. really, really um, surprised and alarmed to hear about, as was the pro tem, as was the speaker. So um, to see everybody working in concert, including the Appropriations Committee, and to have a glide path for it is very rare, but it shows that we can all work together Thank you. Appreciate that and agree. Um, Stephanie, you want to join us? So Stephanie has squared the circle and yeah. has a foolproof <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those numbers that never change. <laughs> um, this is a draft fiscal note. It's. Um, I think we Do you have cut? You have cut. All right. Unless you um, change it. Um, well. You did while we were singing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I have copies of people. <laughs> um, so uh, it, this has been put together a little bit quickly. <laughs> um, but we did have discussions um, with the Department of Health last week um, to understand um, the initial question was how much would it test to cost this, it, to, to, how much would it cost to test all the school buildings out there? Um, and so uh, the health department gave you a $900,000 number. My number was 800 to 850. I think that's a little bit of a, you know, is it 425? And some of them are already abundant or 450 buildings and, a, and the average of 50 taps per building. Um, that number will probably get refined a little bit next week. The uh, Agency of Education has asked, you know, sent out a survey to ask about the number of taps in schools. So we'll see what the result of that is. I think the survey is due back tomorrow or uh, Friday at the end of this week. Um, so I don't know if that'll it will help refine that, but it might help <coughs> refine that number. But um, so it's somewhere in that 800 to 900 thousand dollar is the cost of just that initial testing. Um, it doesn't contemplate um, another round of testing for anything that would be found over whatever the limit is and has an initial remediation. <coughs> and it does not include any remediation cost estimate in it. I, I thought here you mentioned the new testing. Um, there's the two testing, that's the initial two testing. Um, it, what's, it, it's in the um, not included is is any remediation or retesting after remediation, the first round of remediation. Oh, so, so you were yeah. saying this to indicate that this was not included? Yes, the, 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 the remi not, no remediation, not to, you know, no cost for the actual cost of the school to replace the faucet or the plumbing mm -hmm. um, in the first response mm -hmm. <laughs> is what I would characterize that. Does so, it? Uh, uh, if I could just, yeah. um, could you? Revise the fiscal note to uh, to take into account the likely uh, amount of retesting necessary. We can we can probably put a chart together of you know if if it based on the different levels and percentages mm -hmm. that I've heard here today on what that might be in yeah. terms of um, the the potential costs. Um, right, because I, I don't yeah. see how we can responsibly yeah. pretend yeah. that we're not going to need to retest. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I provided in the bottom the note about um, where the child care um, programs are, both the home-based programs and the center-based programs are now. Um, Senator Hart. Um, so two questions. Does this include the child care centers? So it, 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 the, 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 the building count does not include the child care centers, as I understand it. That's, that's, that, that would not. That would be an additional cost as well. If you were going to actually yeah. include the child care centers as part of this initial testing, that initial testing cost would go up, and 
yeah. any retesting would go up. So to the point that we heard from testimony earlier, we would want to include those, I would assume, in order to make sure that they are tested at the at a better, safer if, if level. If you're bringing them in as a, in a new in standard. A, in a new standard <laughs> and a new potential. Yeah. 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 So that was, uh, and then it, it, on the back you have administrative costs, and I was going to actually ask the commissioner of this and didn't, but so this the positions. The, yeah. So the the administration yesterday brought to um, the appropriations committee additional FY19 expenditure requests, and their request was 1.3 million dollars for the lead testing piece, 900 for the initial testing, and then they have 400 thousand dollars for the data management and two um, limited time positions, and that piece hasn't um, the detail on that. I just got about couple hours ago, so that hasn't been vetted on our end yet. But that's just to give you the, the, the uh, what's within that $1.3 million request, um, the two component pieces. So, um, yep. yeah, the child care programs is now on my mind, so. Yeah. And, and you, I don't, it, there are home-based programs and there are center-based programs, and we, you know, we have a pretty good count of those. They, mm -hmm. they do change, um, but that's a, that, that would be an additional. Well, if you want us to revise the fiscal note to include that, we can do yes. that too. <laughs> if, if you could, and um, yeah. you know, because we're 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 considering different avenues, so you yeah. need to know the costs of yeah. all the various avenues. Um, it's it's tough to say we're not going to test child okay. care centers. We're going to wait until kids are five years old. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so especially given what the commission has said about yeah. uh, developing brains. And, yeah. When the survey went out to the schools, uh, was that mentioned every faucet in the schools? Uh, or the, the, just so the, the the survey was from the Secretary of um, Education, and I believe he asked each school to report back, or each, the superintendents and principals to re report back for every building um, the number of um, mm. potable water taps in the school. So um, I don't know how that will, you know, but what the result of that will be, but you will, you might want to have him in. If I, as I recall, it was I think, please respond by Friday of the twenty fifth. And I'm wondering if potable water taps means the same thing. The, the, the yeah, fields, you know, it, the, it, the potential yeah. consumption is what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. I'd imagine yeah. a bunch of those didn't include yeah. you know, sinks in the water or the hose outside or. <laughs> so in other words, I'm I'm thinking the. 850 is actually like 1.5. We'll, we'll. <laughs> 64% of you retested, you know? Well, so, yeah. right, so then you're, you know, so this is what happened when we got working with radon. Our number kept going up, up and up and up. Um, the, the, the good news is the money is there. Um, we have one time funds available that the governor, the appropriations committee, and the leadership has said we can use. So that's one thing. But our long term goal is to address lead and radon. So one of the things I want to make sure doesn't happen is that, uh, what I personally want to make sure doesn't happen is that some link in the chain loses their nerve and says, well, let's stop after lead and leave radon the way they always have. So I do want to be accurate about it, and I want to strike while the yeah. iron is hot, and we have that one time. Yeah, I mean, I do. I mean, all of these are estimates. The yeah. the 50 tap per school estimate is from the sample. I don't know how representative that is of all the 400 mm -hmm. school buildings. I don't know how representative that is of the child care centers. We'll have to get a <laughs> bead on that um, type of thing. So. I don't know about this, but so there are clearly some schools that have already been tested and have yeah. probably been tested well. I mean, the schools you're yeah. working with and then the ones that were in the pilot study. So yeah. is it fair to say we would subtract those out? Or so I think that's the difference between my 800 to 850 and the health department's 900 maybe initially of the initial building count. So uh -huh. that, I think that's where that small difference is right uh, now. I see a hand up in yeah. the back. So <laughs> again, just introduce yourself. Yeah, Brian Redmond, uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, it wouldn't be a subtraction for the NTNCs. These samples would need to be in addition to their obligations under the law. Right. Um, different sample volumes, different sampling methodology. Um, I was pointing at 
uh, oh. uh, Professor Costanza Robinson, who's, who's tested some schools in Asin County, not the ones that have been tested under your program, which I understand is totally different. Yeah. There are, I do believe there are a handful of schools yeah. um, that have and tested outside the pilot as well. The so. commission, yeah. commission for you, there may be another dozen schools that after the pilot was announced and was completed, uh, wanted to opt in mm -hmm. uh, and use the protocol. Yeah. So it's obviously difficult to come out with a crystal yeah. numbering yeah. screen. Have the results of those exactly. well <laughs> actually been released? Uh, not public. So, Stephanie, if you if you wouldn't mind, I, I think we understand what you've yeah. done here. Good, good first. Uh, it was just the yeah. If if you could um, redo it in light of the statistically predictable retesting, um, so that's the second round for those taps that were remediated, um, and then the child care centers, if if we included those. What would that add? So um, I, 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 we can come up with an estimate for that. Do you want just the center-based, or do you want all licensed child care, which includes the home-based child care? And you, give us <laughs> both, both <laughs> sure. estimates. Yeah. I mean, child-based is, you know, there, there are a number of things that are different about those programs than, yeah. than others. I don't know if this is one of the differences we want to allow. Yeah. It would be good to know the, the actual numbers. Yeah. Well, and we have to. Like three or four faucets versus. 15. Yeah. You know, we yeah. Estimate five. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any other uh, requests on the note that comes back from Seth? Thank you very much, Seth. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll say this for the commissioner of the room, since you might not have heard it the first time I said it, but. This is our number one priority for this committee. We'll, we'll try our best to move this. This bill is not going to stop here. It's going to make at least one more stop in another committee, um, maybe two other committees. So um, we'll, we'll do the initial work on it. Uh, we got great suggestions for revisions today. I'm going to ask uh, Michael Grady to just drop those into the bill. and. Um, keep notes for anything you want to talk about with witnesses or in markup. And we'll, again, we'll be looking to try to move this out like by the beginning of February and keep it, keep it moving at an accelerated pace. Um, any other uh, questions about that? Please, they think we're sent out. Just a bunch of findings. With the findings? Yes. Yes. Where's Daisy? I just want to give you more time. I said, you think you think we're the house with all these findings? Senate is so. <laughs> well, it's supposed to be general purpose. <laughs> <laughs> we don't find you like things. Yes. How, how many times have we been in health and welfare? Thousands. Yes, that's right. You know Would you like to walk us through this? <laughs> if I had my glasses, I would love to walk. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's fair. Does anybody have some fair <laughs> uh, readers? Well, if, hold it up if you really here, can't like to read with our glasses, right we can do it another day. We can, we can ask uh, other people what they think of this, but I, I think it would be great to have you explain it if you can. I think my glasses are down the hall. If you want to bring somebody else, who, if you kill time. Uh, how long will it take? I, 35 seconds. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> if I could see right? my watch, I could tell yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> what? All right, I'll tell you. And the, and the preamble, I could ask you. This other version? Do you? Yeah. The governor's. Do you, the could, could you hand um, oh. Professor a copy of this? <laughs> and and this is and this is what he's going to go through. Just one. And, yeah. and to the extent you could um, run your eye over that, let us know what you think of it as compared to the language currently in the bill. Um, that would be great. And don't then, worry about finding it. Don't the around the. Uh, Definitely, that's no, I just gave it. Really you could definitely <laughs> skip over the findings one to one. Okay, <laughs> I've said most of them. We will, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you would anyways, but I'm just that's saying that. <laughs> first step, you'll be all the back. Right. 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 Right
story didn't know that. The, hor <laughs> the horrible thing <laughs> is, correct me if I'm wrong. I guess it just slow builds down because of the funding. It's just extra days that it's like the video room. Isn't that so like, like one person gets assigned yeah. to produce the findings and that's like the whole thing? No? No. So the committee would have a debate, and if I really didn't like the bill, I'd hit anyway, so the findings hard, and you could get start stripping and yeah. taking up days. And <laughs> it's a good delay tactic. Yep. You still lose, but <laughs> slow it down. Slow it down. Okay. So if you could uh, again just introduce yourself and and then show us what you're what you're doing. Sure. So my name is David Englander. I'm the my actual title is I'm the senior policy and legal advisor to the Commissioner of Health. I'm delighted to be before you. Um, the proposal, as, as you'll see, is fairly, other than the findings, um, <laughs> is, is, fairly, is fairly stripped down and, 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 leaves, uh, and leaves a lot of the work um, to, the, to the agencies and to work with, uh, to work with schools. And to the, the, the pri well, so, so briefly, so um, if we're starting, um, we have the brief definitions, we have 1232. Which is the which is the deadline, um, and and actually, we become more sanguine as we've had discussions with our lab folks, and we think we can do it by January one of 2020, and not and at June third. We were concerned about the capacity of the lab, and now we feel like we do have. Now I say the lab, I'm referring to the Department of Health lab. We 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 we're we're, we're, we're confident at this point that we can um, and do the lab, and that but the but the proposal also allows for um, the lab if it finds that we we have a a, a glut. Um, at one time that we can contract out for it. Uh, there's an exception for schools that are uh, have already tested, whether it be through the pilot program or whether on their own initiative, so long as the, the testing protocols are roughly comparable to the ones that are uh, that have been used by the Department of Health that are consistent with the C with the three T's in the in the EPA document. Slender Ash. Yeah. Be glad that you used Vogler. I noticed that too. <laughs> we're all from New England. I think we're both from New England. In fact, I think that he and I were, he and I were both born in the same town, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Um, <laughs> Nearing three o'clock. <laughs> it's when I self destruct. The, uh -oh. <laughs> so this this proposal does not have it does not actually have. So we're looking at twelve thirty. So we're at the, the, the top of page, the top of page two, 1233. It doesn't it doesn't actually have um, a, remedia a remediation limit as the commissioner described. There is no safe level of of level of, of lead in water. So uh, it would this would abide by the Vermont Water Supply Rule, which today is is 15. Um, but as des as described earlier, the 15 is not is not a health based level. Five yeah. isn't a health based level. Yeah. Um, but it could be subject to uh, the water supply rule, um, and in, in its place, of course, the general assembly could choose could choose another level of its of its, uh, of its desires. Um, B provides any outlet for which a test can, result is found to be equal or greater than the action level shall be discontinued its use until such time as the outlet tests below the action level, so that you can see that that requires retesting uh, post remediation, but also the importance of as soon as we know that, that, the, that, that there's lead above a certain level in a tap that has to be stopped immediately and not, this is nothing we put off until tomorrow. Uh, in, in 1234, um, it requires that, uh, that, um, that every parent or guardian be notified of the, of the results, either, um, either by mail directly or put on its website. I think it, it's wise to include, and something that's not in the proposal, is the idea that we should, we should be informing parents and guardians that this testing is taking place. Here it says uh, you must do both. No, no, I thought I heard you say either or both. So I like, I like this way of doing it. I, I yes. think in the bill that we have, it says posting on the website. Mm -hmm. um, most parents are not going to. Are not going to. Precisely. So we should, if nothing else, we should pop out that sentence and stick it in the bill yep. um, for direct notification. But what this proposal says is each school shall provide information on the results of the testing directly, and the center brought up the importance of, of providing warning to, to parents yeah, beforehand as well. Yeah. yeah. That's not it. And that's, and that's not here, but is, in a, is, is, is actually, of course, a, a critical point. Um, 
the department proposes that that the Department of Health would actually create a form that that uh, schools could fill out, and that way, uniform information is being provided to uh, to uh, to parents and, and guardians and, and members of the community. So it's just a very something that's very simple and understandable. So so parents aren't getting you know data sheets. Mm -hmm. Something very simple that very, that very clearly you know has boxes that schools would fill out. Uh, the, the proposal requires mediation steps. If any outlet tests about lack of the school will inform the parent or guardian, and, and any of the, the steps that are being taken will be taken to remediate the presence of lead. Uh, the last section, 1235, is um, is just is general rulemaking authority given uh, by the commission to work uh, with A and R, um, as well as AOE, to adopt as rules as necessary for the purposes of implementing, administering, or enforcing requirements of this chapter. It's just a broad rulemaking authority yeah. that that is just to deal with things that are unforeseen. Um, but that have more rules have more teeth than uh, you know a statement by you know by by, by a commissioner that the, that the, these are things that need to be applied because as we all know rules are enforced like they are laws. So my very quick scan of this and my maybe spotty memory of, of the bill itself, it seems as though the bill covers almost everything you have here, but more specifically. Um, it, it, is there is there some approach here that you prefer, uh, and, and if so, why so? Well, by having instead of having so so the, this proposal provides that the Department of Health, working with ANR, would would create the, the the sampling protocol, as opposed to having a law, and that that allows, as I said, to hopefully briefly and quickly before, um, is. It does allow us to have the best possible protocol that is sensitive to to new data, to new science, as well as to you know how things are actually working in schools, as opposed to prescribing specifically what yeah. what you know how it's actually done on the ground. Yeah. So we're back to Senator Parent's question about uh, enumerating in the statute versus rulemaking, um, or 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 if I or if I may, or 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 just establishing by protocol. Uh, questions? Anyone? Right now, the bill just says the EPA's protocol. Yes. You'd rather just have you, because if you want to differ from the EPA's protocol, you would, that would give you the ability to do so? It would. Mm -hmm. I mean, as of today, we would use EPA's protocol. But sometimes, just hypothetically, Vermont could do things better than EPA. Senator so Hardy, Senator. It seems to me that we could uh, add language to the, the specific language that we already have in the other draft that says, should there be better protocols in the future, we, something we would direct the agency or the Department of Health to use the best protocols po possible or something that yeah. would give like future flexibility, because I would prefer the more prescriptive approach at this point that sets out the parts per billion and yeah. the protocol rather than just uh, if nothing else for for public um, uh, awareness of what we're doing and that we actually took action and that we're, we're, we have standards for what we're requiring you guys to do um, and then allowing that flexibility in the future if things get better if you come up better yeah I, I lean that way as well yeah. too because I think ultimately if there is any fight over this bill it will be over the parts per billion standard and we've if you follow the progress of toxics bills through through the House and the Senate, you know that um, they attract all sorts of arcane attempts to stop them, slow them, weaken them. Um, this has so much juice behind it. I have a hard time seeing it succeeding, but that doesn't mean somebody won't argue that fifteen parts per billion should be the standard because it will save us a lot of money um, and there's no real reason to worry beyond that so I would also like a standard in the bill I suppose I'd also like the, the protocol for testing in the bill um, for much the same reason that you can by controlling the testing you can ultimately control the price tag um, at the risk of questions of children's health so well, could we have all the oh, I'm sorry. I, I skipped over there. Uh, um, thank you. 
Um, so, uh, Ledge Council wanted to create a whole new chapter in 10 BSA, and yours, I noticed, is uh, in 18 BSA. Um, uh, it's changing, it's amending the, the existing chapter. Right? Yeah. Why, um, why did you pick that chapter for your? Because, we, because this is. Um, because we really see the department, both the Department of Health and the Agency of Natural Resources, right, Ron? Yes. Really see the Department of Health as, as leading this program. Mm -hmm. um, so we really felt this. I mean, if it exists in 10 with, with, with the blending language, it, it's sort of neither here nor there. But the way, we, the way we imagined it as we were drafting together is that it would be, that we would be the lead and that would be the, the point of contact for much of this work. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Oh, it might have been more of a committee comment. So okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chair. Let's start with that committee comment. Oh, I just thought we could make it very prescriptive for this timeline for this first testing so that it's clear what it is and how quick it's happening, and then we don't have to worry about rules. But then I'll give them the authority to set their rules and protocols for the ongoing testing. Mm -hmm. and, and we could say they can be no weaker. Right, right. Mm -hmm. the new rules. We do that with federal guidelines. You can't, you can't under, undershoot the fence, but you can overshoot. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So we could do a similar kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so it, it seems to me that everything is coming along like gangbusters, but we doubled our, our estimate potentially. <laughs> so Probably more than double If we add all the chunk there, that's what I'm saying. Well, Chair, at 1.4, you just have 65% of that cost on yeah. top if you got to run retest and then you know, child care centers, which I'm assuming double that. Yeah. Not maybe not double it, but these times I'll have to say 2.5. And, and uh, we haven't picked a, Dustin used to say choose your own adventure. We haven't, we haven't chosen our adventure yet. I, I don't know what will ultimately come down on in terms of the universe that we're looking to address. I've been assuming universal buy-in from the administration and the speaker and, and the pro tem. It may be that we pick a path where ultimately somebody goes off the bus um, in terms of how much money we're spending or how broadly we're casting the net. I'd like to start with the strongest possible bill. If that means the price tag is higher, then someone else can be in charge of um, <laughs> rationing protection <laughs> on down the, the road. I, I think what we're talking about is poison. It's um, maybe more of an issue in a child care center than it is in a, in a high school, just because of the, the, the difference in the, the children that would be there. So I, I lean toward what we asked Stephanie to put together, the, the most all-inclusive cost. That's where I would see myself wanting to take this, but we'll we'll straw vote each of those decisions and see what we wind up. You know, very, very rarely hear me say this, but I would agree with that approach on this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, since it's such a serious problem, if we do go the route of like keeping it with you know AHS and uh, the Department of Health, then I wonder if we should try to make public you know, put some money aside for PSAs or something for people who are on wells, of which we have many, you know, in, in Vermont, to test, you know, especially if they have children, to, that they should test their own water, just making, just making them more aware of the problem. I'm trying to remember when PFOA, and maybe the commissioner remembers, when the PFOA thing in Bennington hit, a bill went through natural resources, I believe made it all the way, where it required a sequence of testing of wells, um, and there were seven or eight substances that they were supposed to test for. Was lead one of them? No. Uh, yes, uh, Brian Redmond for uh, Environmental Conservation. Lead is one of the constituents as part of the mandatory testing provision, but that's only for new potable water supplies. Okay. So if a homeowner is drilling a well, it wouldn't get to everything that's existing out there and approximately 55% of Vermonters are served by their own well. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, I have my own well and I've tested my water and I have all kinds of nasty things in it that I have to For the point of this, the one a year, so the issue might not even be your well, it might be the faucet. Right. In your yeah, house. Yeah. yeah, 
and, and then how where, where would even in here just to, for some kind of public education like how would a homeowner go about you know if it's 20 bucks most people probably don't need to get paid the 20 bucks they go out and test their own mm -hmm. Um, but is yeah. it possible for the private citizen to find a twenty dollar test? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, I, or, no, because I've done it. I've done it. But you're yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, it. yeah. Um, but you said pay for yourself. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. just talking about just making people a bit more aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not not offering them any money. I'm I'm assuming maybe I'm wrong that the Department of Health probably already has some kind of educational outreach on lead, if only the paint side. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. On the paint, yeah. But, sure. but does does that uh, educational campaign include water? Yes. No. <laughs> I mean, I have to get a, a sheet. Like, I have a apartment building. I have to get a sheet. It's pre nineteen seventy whatever building. I get the sheet, but we've never. Yeah. I've never thought to test the water like that. And we run city water, but mm -hmm. much more likely to consider to go through. Has to make sure it's safe. And so this is David Inler. So yeah. in, our, in our safe homes program, we do it's most, most exposure is a result of pre seventy eight paint chips. Mm -hmm. So when uh, when requested, we will go into a home and we'll find this the source that typically typically is is you know it's, it's lead paint in the window well. Um, and so we don't require testing. And I do want to say if I may. So testing is so the Department of Health offers offers well offers uh, water testing for residents. Um, and that does include lead. But fewer than five percent. I got this right, Brian. Mm -hmm. So fifty-five percent are so off of wells, and about five percent, roughly five percent, um, are tested. Mm -hmm. And so we do education and PSAs on that, but we've not been very enough. We do education and PSAs on water as well. On, wa on, on water testing, generally. Okay. Yeah. So they're they're maybe right. covering that base. It's not to say it couldn't be beefed up. Yeah. Um, especially in light of this. If a child has a greater than 10 microgram decimeter level in their blood, you go into the home and do this total assessment. Mm -hmm. um, but as you heard from the professor, once on their own test testing, they need to know the testing protocol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the sort of thing we could probably just, you know, urge the department to do. And, Department could voluntarily alter what they're producing to, to speak to this. Um, okay, so one stitch that's dropped is Michael Grady was not here, nor was Jim. I had hoped to have Jim keep an eye on all these things. So if you could ask Michael Grady if he's able to come, is he able to come? No, he's not available. Okay. Um, well, I, I tried to keep an eye on the things that I thought should go into the bill. Anybody else who has Senator notes? Senator Hardy? Yeah. Um, maybe, uh, could you drop any message to come here to the And then we'll, we'll give him those additions. We'll um, have him produce another version. We'll send you that version. Send the commissioner and anybody else you'd like to have copy so that you can see as we as we go along. And um, I'd also like to, with these new estimates, I'd like to check back in with the chair of appropriations and just make sure that she and the pro tem understand that we, we may be talking about bigger price tags than we thought. Um, other, other issues? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I wonder if we talk about vi uh, visiting our visits and yeah, trips. Yeah, let's do that. Um, because um, a, 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 an expert that I consulted is in, actually in the room and could, could help speak. Um, to the, so I got the suggestion I got from Voices for Vermont's Children um, was North Country Union, uh, North Country uh, Supervisory Union is would be that's up in the Newport area. Yeah. <laughs> Said too far. Yeah. Not my favorite superintendent. All they are. Yeah. So I wondered if Carla might speak to why that would be a good no, spot. Or no uh, aspersions cast on North Country or its children. It's just the superintendent. <laughs> anyway. 
I, I, not to say we can't go. We'll just not meet with the superintendent. <laughs> what, what's just the kidding, purpose we'll of going up there? I think they, um, there was a school in particular, I think maybe in J, or yeah. in that area that has a pre-K program mm -hmm. um, that um, we thought would be of interest. And, and how, that, you know, equity, they're kind of looking at equity um, in that program and how it translates to the um, uh, kids going into the elementary school. And Samantha Stevens is Yeah. And kidding aside, happy to happy to go there. I think the Northeast Kingdom is a, a, a logical place for us to reach out to. Um, so, if you'd like to, Debbie, if you'd like to do initial mm -hmm. setup work, or logistics, and mm -hmm. rope Peter in. Okay. Um, anybody have any objections to that being our first spot? Yeah. Mm, that makes sense. First come, first serve. So. If you want to have us come out to your community, I'm, I'm going to ask the committee to go to um, somewhere in Chittenden County, putting that together, um, and I'll describe that to you later on. Um, but probably we could do at least one more. So, Addison, Rutland. Um, We're already in Addison, Washington. Washington. Yeah. Washington. We're in Washington, Washington, Washington every day. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, James and I had talked about going to Orwell, which is kind of on the border of our two <coughs> districts, and they have a really good pre-K program there that it's a public-private partnership. Sure. It's in the school, but it works with a private um, child care center, mm -hmm. and I've heard good things. I have not personally visited, but I've heard good things. Um, one thing that may be a little dicey is they're one of the... Uh, the yeah. gray areas. <laughs> I thought they voted to well, do it. They, um, they were absorbed by voting. Yeah, they're, they're, they're still apparently. They're we all, they, uh, they emailed us last night, so uh, they they are still I, I think that's, play, apparently. that's fine. I mean, um, we'll just be ready for maybe an extra year full. Yeah, and I'm happy to reach out to them and the superintendent, if you don't mind, because he's your superintendent, too. Do you want to that's fine. You did the Taylor, Taylor. I think that's right. Really, I, have, yeah, I haven't met her personally, but I'm happy to reach out to her. Yeah, if we could do something for the yeah, sure. yeah, so. supervisor. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay. Right on the edge. And then we could, I mean, on the way, we could stop other places or sure. whatever. If you, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how much time we're talking about. It's conceivable, even though those are pretty far apart. We could do both in one day, so we could get permission from our morning committees to be absent and go to, let's say, um, if it's Jay in the morning, have lunch, then drive for a meeting in Orwell. I don't know if we'd make it down yeah, to Orwell. It's Orwell. Oh, it's Probably Chittenden. Madison Orwell. County is really hard to get through efficiently. OK. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> well, then let's think of it as two Yeah, I think, I think it would have to be yeah. one way. Yeah. yeah. You're going to need to go to Orwell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, or if we. I mean, we could pick someplace else that's closer, too. No, we're, I mean, we're it's just a thought that I had. And yeah. they, they may not want us. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll, you know, what we could do is leave, um, leave right after morning committee, get to Orwell whenever we get there, do what we need to do, then we're all going home from that right. point. So we're not on the clock, uh, except with our spouses and kids. Can you on a Friday? We do it on Friday. You guys will be well, close. Yeah. Let's do it on a Friday. Then yeah. we'd be close did, to home. Then we yeah. would just go home. Right. Sure. And not come back. That would make. That's for you guys. That's 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 that would be right. key for us. You know, yeah. Yeah. A fancy car. <laughs> a fancy I, car. I, I call shotgun Debbie. <laughs> Debbie has like night rider. You remember that? Show? Yeah. You do. Her car goes home. Nice car. <laughs> Where would you like to go today? <laughs> what kind of car do we? Oh, it's a Mercedes. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> Y'all okay. can come in my minivan. <laughs> okay, so that's good. So that's our first two stops. Um, and okay. just go ahead and begin working. Uh, look for available dates. If you just bring a couple dates back into the committee so we make sure that we find one that works for everybody. And then I will get permission from pro temp for us to be um, gone at that point to make sure there are no 
important votes or, you know, because we'll miss floor time if it's an afternoon. Uh, so in other words, if it's not Friday or Tuesday, we'll miss afternoon floor time. So, okay. But if it is Friday, which is they're shooting for, for, for the other thing. Yeah. How close is shore to a floor Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah, it's a different. Is it in the Addison Central? Yeah, Shoreham is in yeah. Addison Central. Orwell is now in whatever, Rutland. Greater Rutland. Yeah. Oh, it's Slate Valley, actually. Oh, oh that's Slate, Slate Valley. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But they're in my Senate district because Orwell is actually in Addison County. Yeah. So I think that's all we have to do today. So just a quick note on tomorrow. Oh, I was going to meet. Yeah, just um, have oh. um, that's that's why he gets the big books. I don't think the committee gets the committee. And I'll just, if you, if you have something you want to make sure gets dropped in, you can stick around and talk to him with me. But I, I think I picked out most of the things. Um, so for tomorrow, we have um, the governor's budget address at 2. Mm -hmm. So we'll be in here at 1.30. So you'll meet Susan Stitely. Another one of the usual suspects um, who helps us out with independent colleges. And then it has us back in at 3.30 on this bill. I think that should be OK. I, I may be a little later because I've been asked to come to the Clifton office immediately following. So if that's the case, Debbie will go ahead and start at 3.30. Um, and then on Friday, because as I told you, I'm thinking about dropping the language on homeschoolers, that's going to um, thin up what we have scheduled for Friday. I'm going to put um, more lead uh, testimony in there. So hopefully we can get a revision from Mike and a revision from Stephanie. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to see if they can do that on Friday so that we'd have a current bill to go up on the website on Friday, and then people over the weekend can be checking in on that. OK. Any <coughs> comments, new business? Just a question. So are we meeting tomorrow at 1.30 before the yes. governor's budget? And then we go from there, from here to? Then we go to yeah, the Senate yeah, floor. So the floor, floor. floor. At 1.50. Yes. OK. Somebody was going to be keeping track of time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then my second. Here's the bills. Yeah. <laughs> The, I would uh, testimony on the pre-K bill. I have a constituent who, who was mentioned yesterday, Meg Baker, who is yeah. our regional coordinator, and I'm trying to get her to come in and testify. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. So um, Jeannie and I will do the schedule for next week. I'll try to make one day purely pre-K. Okay. Um, and then we'll be doing the, the lead well, let's say lead and pre-K because I don't think um, we should start on the Ethnic Studies Bill until it comes to us from the House. Um, but that will, I think, get voted out of committee and might reach us by the week after next. Okay. So next week we'll do pre-K and lead and then um, hopefully get close to a, a form where we might vote the lead bill out all of Okay. But in other words, there will be a day for pre-K and just be in touch with Jeannie in terms of who you want to Great. Thank you.